Today we continue our study in systematic theology. In our first study, we covered the doctrine. In this study, we're covering God because basically we're going to be looking at, at 50 different doctrines that are covered in the Bible. These are Baptist doctrines because they are Bible doctrines. And these are Bible doctrines because the Bible is the word of God, which makes them God's doctrine. And if we're going to study God's doctrines, first thing we need to do is what Brother Joe did in the last study, which was defining what the doctrine was. This study, we're going to define who God is. Because if you don't know who God is and you don't know what a doctrine is, you have no foundation for studying the doctrines of God. Who is God? It depends upon who you ask. There are many man-made definitions of God. Uh, to some, they actually kind of say the right thing, but for the wrong reason. They'll say, well, God is in the water. Or they'll say, God is the water, God is the air. God is basically, to them, a compilation of what we call creation, what they call the universe. When you put all of them together, you have, quote-unquote, God. George Lucas promoted this in the Star Wars sagas, but he called it the Force because back in the 80s, if you called that God, they would consider that much more sacrilegious than they would now. The great thing about this to these people who were into that is that that God is unfeeling, impersonal, and blameless because it doesn't really care what we do. It's just there. Because of that, we don't answer to it. Makes it very popular. Some do actually think God is a sentient being. But it's neither good nor evil because he or she has created us for the purpose of amusement. We've all been amused. We've watched puppies chase their tails. And kittens chase laser lights across the wall. Hamsters running in their cages and all like that. And again, this God really doesn't care about good or evil. To that, we've created good and evil. This God has just created us for basically entertainment value. Some, on the other hand, think there are many gods. We have each a separate sphere of control because as humans, as mankind, we generally think of multitasking as being able to walk and chew gum at the same time. And they can't fathom a God who is able to control everything. So obviously there's just a whole plethora of them out there, and each one of them, like one will control the rain, one will control sunshine, one will control wind. It kind of gets confusing after a little bit. If you look at the, the Norse gods, they actually still have an influence on our lives. They have this one god named Tyr. He's the god of law. Because their courts operated on the third day of the week, they became known as Tyr, which we now call Tuesday. The father of their gods was Woden. We've kind of dropped the W and Odin. But Woden's day has become Wednesday. You have the god of thunder who's been made popular because of the Avengers movies. And it's funny. He's the god of thunder. He's not the god of lightning. He's not the god of something he actually decimated or destroy you. He He's the god of the noise that scares cats and dogs. Thursday came from Thor's day, and Freya, the god of fire, is the change into Friday, the day the worker looks forward to. These are gods made in the image of man. Because of that, they're petty, they're flawed, they argue amongst themselves, and they reward or punish us, depending upon their own little whim. Most of these gods worship out of fear of duty. If you were a farmer and you wanted a good crop, you went to, I guess, the god of the soil, god of rain, god of sun. Although you'd think that'd be kind of a conflict of interest. Like I said, it's kind of complicated. So let us now consider the one true god. Question number one. Is there a supreme being? We don't have to go very far in the Bible for that answer. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There was no committee, because goodness knows if there was, it would probably taken a lot more than six days for creation to occur. No pantheon of gods who got together to plan out what went into this. God did this without asking anyone's permission, seeking anyone's help, anyone's guidance. He just chose to do it. He acted alone because before creation, he was alone. Everything that came into existence was solely due to him. So yes, there is a supreme being. Question number two, is God visible? Colossians chapter 1 verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. I just want to pause here for one moment on the word firstborn here. This is a legal term. This is not a literal term. In our next study, which Brother Joe is going to take care of, he's going to look at the doctrine of the Trinity. So I'm not going to step on anything he's going to talk about there. We're going to concentrate on the image of the invisible God. 
God is infinite and he is holy. We are finite and we are unholy. We are sinful. It is foolish to think that we could ever comprehend understanding all that God is. You can't fit an ocean in a thimble. God's holiness would blind our feeble eyes were we to see him. In fact, in Exodus chapter 34, Moses had asked to see the glory of the Lord. And the Lord told him, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. To protect us from what would overwhelm and kill us, God has made himself invisible to us. Question number three. Is God a material being? John chapter 4 verse 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. As material beings ourselves, we are limited to one place. It would be great if we could be in more than one place at once. A lot of times it would be convenient, but... But we, we can't be. God as a spirit is omnipresent, everywhere, all at once. We are limited to linear time. Wouldn't it be great if we could actually travel back sometimes and correct a mistake we made? Or I have a friend who would love to be able to do that just to pick the right lottery numbers. But we are limited to linear time. God dwells outside of time in eternity. Our knowledge is limited to what we see and learn. Purpose of school, which we thought was foolish back then, but looking back, at least when we were in school, they, they taught us some wonderful things. Nowadays, they add some stuff to it. God is omniscient, aware of everything, knows everything. Our material bodies have many physical limitations and can be damaged in many ways. You learn as you get older that the ways that you are limited and the ways that you can be damaged increase with age. God is omnipotent. The material universe has a beginning, and one day in the future it will have a new beginning. Before there was material, there has always been spiritual. God is not a material being. Question number four. Has God flesh and bones, a body like we have? Luke chapter twenty-four thirty-nine. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. So is this a trick question? No. God the Son put on a material body when he was born to become our Redeemer. He was 100% man, or remaining 100% God. Is that hard to fathom? This is where faith comes in. God can do things that pass our understanding, and yet we can accept it by faith without being able to fully understand it, or even answer questions when some people throw stupid stuff at us saying that if we can't explain it, we can't possibly believe it. Question number five. Is God a mere force, or is he a distinct personality? Exodus chapter 3 and 14. God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning of verse 9 having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Sentience is one of the signs of an intelligent being. We learned this in Star Trek, the Next Generation's episode called The Measure of a Man. Odds are we had figured on that before then, but God is fully aware of his own sentience. We read in Exodus the meaning of the Lord's holy name. I am that I am. Name has many different means, means many different things. First, it means that he is not an it. Even now, there are times when people are talking about the Holy Spirit, and they will refer to the Holy Spirit as an it and not a he. The Holy Spirit is God. God is not an it. It is sacrilegious, whether you want to say it or not. Second, he is self-existing. He is because he is. He exists because of himself. Third, he wants us to know who he is. A force does not have a purpose or a plan. No intelligence, no sense of what is going on, and no organization. God is, through everything that we learn about him in the Bible, the polar opposite of a force. He is a unique 
personality. Question number six. Is God a changeable being? Malachi chapter three, verse six. For I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. James chapter one, verse 17. James is like the Proverbs of the New Testament. It's got some wonderful wisdom in it. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and in all places at one time. Before creation, he knew every sin that we would ever do. He knew exactly how many raindrops were going to be in the flood, the flat path of every snowflake to ever fall, and the number of hairs on our head, even if he has to subtract every day or so. Even now, he knows the answers to any questions we might ever ask. He cannot change, because for him to change, he would become something less than God. Question number seven. When God is said to repent or to change his mind, what is meant? This is what we call an anthropomorphism, big college word. God breaks down something he does into a statement that we can readily understand. For example, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 10 and 11, the word of God says, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. When we repent, we are turning away from the sin that we've committed, with the intent of never doing it again, never having anything to do with it again. Now, God knew what Saul was going to do. This wasn't anything that took him by surprise. He allowed Israel to pick the king that they wanted to pick, and they picked Saul. But here he's telling Samuel that Saul will never return to him. So God will never have anything to do with Saul again. God has given up on Saul and just left him to his own devices. In the New Testament, if, if you think that God doesn't give up on people, take a look at Romans chapter 1, start about verse 21 and read, and we'll find out, you'll find out that God does indeed give up on people after a while, leaves them to their own devices. Question number eight. How many true gods are there? Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. This is the first verse I ever learned fully in Hebrew. Hear, O Yisrael, the Lord our God is one Lord. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Yisrael, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and besides me there is no God. John chapter 17, verse 3. Jesus speaking here, this is part of the Lord's Prayer. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. There are a couple of cults out there who worship a different God than our God, yet they give their God the same name as ours. To the Mormons, who refer to their God as Elohim, he was a man as we are, lived as we did, sinned as we do, and eventually died as we eventually will die. The group of gods that they have rewarded him by giving him earth to be their god. They never explain where those gods came from and where those gods came from, where those gods came from, because, well, it's fiction anyway. This version of God actually came down to planet earth and had physical sex with Mary for Jesus to be born in, in their mythology. Now, you have your Jehovah's Witnesses. They worship a God that they call Jehovah. But this is not a triune form of the God. They believe that Jesus was his first creation, citing the scripture that I mentioned earlier with the legal term as opposed to the literal term. They believe that the Holy Spirit is his active force. Neither of these false religions' gods line up with a biblical God. In fact, any religion that uses anything outside of an uncorrupted copy of the Holy Scriptures that includes the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate. That has been corrupted. The Pope wears a crown that says in Latin, in place of Christ. They kiss his ring. They kiss his foot. For all I know, they kiss other parts of his anatomy. They call him a vicar for the vicarious representation. He is none of that. Anyone who worships a God outside of the God that is in an uncorrupted copy of the Holy Scriptures is worshiping 
a false god. There are many false gods, but only one true God. He is the Lord. Question number nine. What is the real character of God? John chapter 4, 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. As a spirit, his character is incorruptible. Now, because of sin, all of creation has a death sentence placed on it. Dogs die because of Adam's sin. Trees die because of Adam's sin. Everything dies because of Adam's sin. That's our fault. That's on us. This is spelled out in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And how is that done? Well, the answer to that is actually in uh, 1 John chapter 3 and 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Before we go any further here, 1 John was written to believers. It's not written to the world. So anyone who thinks that this is reference to Joe Sinner out there, Joe unsaved, it is not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. God is spirit. He is incorruptible. He is immortal. Question number 10. What is God's chief attribute? 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Again, the letter to believers. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Four different Greek words mean love. The first word is eros, and eros speaks of physical love. We find the use of it in the English language in the word erotic. The second is spergos, and that speaks of familiar love. That word actually is not in the Bible, but the reverse of it, astorgos, is. There it is translated in English as without natural affection. Stergos is the love that you have for your friends, the love that you have for family, the people that you hang around, the love and the camaraderie you feel for them. The third is philea. It's the deepest human love possible. Wives are commanded to philea their husbands. It's the deepest human love possible. There is one love that is above that, and that is the word here that is being used, which is agape, sacrificial love. God gave mankind free will. Otherwise, we'd be robots. We'd still be perfect, but robots, obedient, not individuals. You can't have a real personal relationship with an unfeeling automaton. Found out during the power outage that I loved having a refrigerator. Kept food cold, but I was not in love with my refrigerator. There is a difference. God loves us enough that he wants a personal relationship with every one of us. He knew that Adam would fall into sin, so long before he made a plan ready. He loves us enough to make the plan simple enough that everyone could do it. If salvation required walking across this church, my wife has a disability that would prevent her from doing that. She would not be able to be saved. If the plan involved doing the New York Times crossword every Sunday, a lot less of us would be saved. But he made it simple. Faith. He loves us enough that he allowed his only son to die for us. Who does that? It's one thing to love someone enough that you're willing to die for them. What mother in here loves anyone enough that they would allow one of their children to die for them? Every instinct inside a mom is to protect her children. It's the same thing with a father. Every instinct is to protect your children. So to love someone enough that you would let your child die for them is beyond any scope of love that we could ever truly understand. He did this because he never wants to spend a single second away from any one of us. He loves the doper. He loves the alcoholic. He loves the rapist, the serial killer, the occultist, the witch, and the terrorist just as much as he does you. I saw a bumper sticker I'd love to get. I don't know if I'd ever put on a vehicle. It says, Jesus loves you. Everyone else thinks you're a jerk. But God loves us enough that if we don't want to spend eternity with him, he honors that request as well. Next time you read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, substitute God Anytime you see the word charity or love, if you have a non-King James version of the Bible, you'll see that it still reads true because God is love. But don't get confused because love is not God. In our next study, we're going to look at the power that God possesses. Does God have limitations? Actually, he does. Surprise you? Well, in part two, let's learn what it is he cannot do.